broadcasting from Salisbury University campus. This is WSDL Ocean City, NPR News Talk 90.7, putting Delmarva first. Stay tuned for Delmarva Today with your host, Don Rush. The nation is marking the 400th anniversary of the first African slaves to land at Jamestown, but they were not the first to arrive on what would become the continental U.S. Welcome to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. It's been said that the history of slavery has been anglicized with the British colonies, and there's no doubt that Jamestown was a defining moment. But long before 1619, African slaves were brought to Florida as the Spanish embarked on their colonial empire in the Americas that would last some 300 years. With us to talk about this little-known history, we on the phone with us uh, Dr. Susan Pickman, who has written about life on the Spanish-American colonial frontier. Welcome to the program. Thank you. So give me some sense about this early history. Uh, as I was doing some of the research, it, uh, Africans and blacks in particular were almost in a part of this exploration that began uh, by Columbus in 1492. Yes, they were on each of the expeditions, we believe, and uh, certainly by the 1520s, they were part of the um, expedition that found its way to Florida. In 1565, when St. Augustine was founded, it was a fairly multicultural society, in fact. Uh, there were Africans there, there were Indians, there were Europeans who had uh, come from Spain, Italy, um, later on the Canary Islands. But uh, So there was quite some difference. Uh, some of the slaves that um, were left, the, the uh, 1520 expeditions, were um, decimated considerably by the um, uh, temperature and uh, other aspects of Florida, which were very inclement. Uh, and they moved in uh, with some of the Native American groups. So, in fact, there were quite a number of Native American groups before the Europeans arrived. But in Florida, as in many other places, um, they were killed off um, mostly by disease. The, um, the Spanish uh, were, in a sense, more hospitable to African slaves who came to um, Spanish territory, which caused an ongoing conflict with the um, British and the Carolinas. And uh, they, of course, embraced slavery, whereas Spanish Florida did have slaves but slaves were able to buy their freedom. And if they came from the Carolinas and they uh, became Catholics and they worked in public works, they were able to become citizens. And in fact, uh, they were able to own land and uh, were able to participate in society. There was a, um, an African town much of a fortification um, close to St. Augustine called Fort Moise. And uh, there they were free. They had, um, they were able to intermarry. They were able to farm their own plots of land and the like. But the uh, discrepancy between um, the laws in Spanish Florida and in the, and the British Carolinas um, caused conflict for many, many years. And in fact, eventually the Spanish were required to adopt the, um, or not encourage uh, Africans, slaves from the British colonies to come south. Although there was considerable trade across the border because the Spanish uh, Florida was allegedly sustained by something called the Situado system, an economic, uh, uh, an economic system for the frontier, and it didn't work. And so they traded 
across the border a fair amount to sustain themselves. Let me ask you this. The Spanish government obviously condoned the slavery, but there was seems to be underlying uh, the Spanish rule, particularly uh, in its colonial period, uh, with a sense that you uh, should treat people sort of justly. I mean, I recall, uh, for instance, there were uh, efforts to take a look at how the Spanish, for instance, treated the Native Americans. There was a, a certain religious quality to that. What Can you give me some sense about the Spanish approach to, to individual rights or individual dignity, I guess, e even if they were slaves? Uh, people were allowed to marry, and there is indication of uh, Native Americans and uh, Africans marrying. Uh, at one point, there was a, um, a need to go into the um, Castillos and Marcos, the, the fortification in town, and the first child born there was born of uh, a Native American and uh, African couple. Now, I can't tell whether that person was a slave or not, but they were able to marry. The same thing applies to women. Women in the British colonies were not allowed to keep um, uh, in Spanish Florida. They were able to um, uh, own houses, own property, own businesses, and in fact, a lot of them were widows because it wasn't an easy area to live in, and they were able to keep their inheritances. So that's um, that's very different. And although I'm not a scholar of the British colonial area, it was a more um, just area. You know, slavery was always a horrible thing, no matter where it happened. And in that uh, period of time, Obviously, there's some uh, sense of differences between uh, people of different races, but it's only later on that it started to be um, a lot more class-based. And But under Spanish law, individuals had more rights. Women did, Africans did, slaves did. And there's and Native American populations, but they were pushed to the periphery, as Spanish Florida was part of the periphery of Spain, and uh, they needed to protect themselves. The, the um, at the beginning, uh, the Captaincy General of Cuba was able to help them out, but. Uh, Spain was involved in all kinds of European problems, and as a consequence, very often Spanish Florida was on its own. But the laws of Spain pertained. The first child born of a European um, person, however, was speaking Spanish initially in the United States, something we tend to forget. So in terms of, why do you think that there was such a dramatic difference between how the Spanish viewed slavery as opposed to, say, how the British viewed it? I'm not exactly sure to tell you the truth. I can only tell you that the laws differed substantially. I think it had something to do with um, uh, with religion and the fact that um, they believed that people had grace, especially if they were converted, um, that they were human. And uh, I'm not a religious scholar, but that would be my sense of it. Whereas in other places, they didn't perceive that at all. And slavery had existed for a very long time. It existed in the Mediterranean, and in fact, in some places, it still exists today. But um, the Spanish, for religious reasons, I believe, felt that if people were 
um, Catholics, that they were in the fruit state of grace. It's not to say that they always treated others who were not Catholics in, uh, um, in a particular less hostile fashion. Tell me then a little bit about the function of these slaves um, in terms of what they did, the kinds of tasks that they performed um, during this period. Everything, actually. Some of the slaves became entrepreneurs. They were um, able to become carpenters. They really assisted the colony in its function. and. I suspect because they were treated more humanely, they were more willing to contribute. But um, having come from slavery in the British colonies, uh, their situation was better. And they were able to do um, very many of the same things that everybody else was working on. They were foreigners. There wasn't much land, and it wasn't very helpful, but they were able to uh, have their own crops, and uh, most of the things that uh, others were able to do. Initially, well, the law always stated that the hierarchy of the colony and the presidio were to be individuals who were from Spain. The problem was that in order to get a replacement, should somebody die, it could take a year. So very often there were individuals who were appointed who may not necessarily have been from the peninsula, from Spain. And the Spanish officials weren't supposed to marry locals. Well, that also was not observed. And we notice a lot of um, race-mixed individuals uh, because it, it was necessary. The um, soldiers um, couldn't live unless they mixed with everybody else. And uh, there are many indications that there was a racially mixed group. And although they were identified as such, it doesn't appear as though, especially early on, that um, that there was as much of a hierarchy once you got beyond the, he, um, the military. The other thing is that there were some mujeres mercenarios in town who had um, property stone houses and slaves, and they may have been camp followers. There was a tradition. Uh, there was actually a rule percentage-wise of how many of those could go along with the soldiers, but they were able to um, control their own property, and they their salaries were higher than some of the lieutenants in the army. I mean, a little bit about the, the situation with enslaved women, because as I understand it, they obviously provided domestic work and so on, but also some of them were, as I read, sort of concubines, as it were, for some of the elite. What, what was the situation for, for black women? You know, I, I can't tell you specifically. Um, if somebody was enslaved, obviously they were in a lesser position, and that... Um, that's significant. Um, there were also women who were poor, perhaps um, widows of lower-ranking individuals in the army who didn't make money, and they were they may have been at the mercy of um, others as well. But I can't uh, speak to that in particular. Right, but they did work out, I guess, in the fields and, and in other places as well, I guess. Yes, and they were domestic uh, workers, um, and uh, really any of the technical fields that uh, blacksmithing and that sort of thing, uh, Africans were involved in. So 
And I also understand that there were rebellions from time to time, that this was not something that was idyllic. No, absolutely not. Not only were there rebellions, but also um, there was a, the constant threat of, um, of the British coming down, and uh, at one point they torched the town. And the Indian populations, if they weren't integrated into the town itself, um, they sometimes were living on the outer edge of the town and sometimes in the swamps. And Africans who had um, decided that that was a safer place to be also were there, but that left them more vulnerable than those who could move into the fort. In terms of, uh, yeah, go ahead. can have been an idyllic situation. Um, it was just um, better in the sense that people were able to buy their freedom, but that wasn't always possible. And uh, certainly different groups with the mercy of others. And essentially, as one historian put it, um, that the slaves really helped build what was become the, the Spanish colonial uh, infrastructure it, itself. Um, how significant do you think they were in, in all that, particularly at least for, for Florida? I think they were immensely significant. I think that the town would not have survived as long as it did without the assistance of um, not only the Africans who came initially and the slaves, but the slaves who came from the Carolinas to seek their freedom in Spanish Florida. I, I can't see how the colony could have survived without them. Although slavery, at least African slavery, was not necessarily prevalent uh, throughout the rest of the colonial empire. I mean, much of the work, I guess, as I read and learned long ago, was done by either Native Americans who apparently came with some of the land, as it were, the land grants. Um, it didn't spread like it did, say, in the United States. More in the Caribbean, um, the Spanish portions of the Caribbean um, hmm. needed workers uh, and the adventurers who came initially from Spain weren't people who intended to uh, work with their hands necessarily. And the Indian population that they did enslave in some places uh, died out dramatically. Um, a tremendous genocide, intentionally or not, of the Native American population. Um, and as a consequence, they brought Africans to work on the sugar plantations and the like. In the rest of Latin America, they tried to use the indigenous populations, but um, uh, that didn't work as well as, as they would prefer. But there were um, land grants that were given to the Spaniards who came, and they worked um, the uh, Indian population as much as they could. By the way, returning to Florida for a moment, um, in the United States, in the South, of course, slavery became a very much a, a critical element of the southern economy, particularly plantation economies, in which we see it rapidly growing, particularly after 1800. Um, was there a plantation system that just didn't uh, allow for that kind of growth? Or, I mean, was it just simply the terrain, you think, of, of Florida? Um, yeah, Florida only became um, viable, if you will, uh, uh, a um, fri uh, thriving town, if you will. Um, we have some information because you know, Charles III ordered a patron, sort of an early version of the census, to find out what he had in Spanish Florida. And then in 1763, it was taken over by the British by treaty. So by that time, it was a a town of 3,000 people, and uh, of all varieties of people and uh, um, mixed races. But I wouldn't say that a plantation um, economy developed there until later. 
And uh, at that point, then slavery was brought in. All right. And it was uh, East and West Florida. And it, it was under British control. Is this, uh, we, we talk a lot about Jamestown and obviously the 400th anniversary and so on. Is this history well-known, say, in, in Florida? I mean, it's not something that we tend to think about because obviously it's been overshadowed by probably the very significance, particularly of, of Jamestown. Yeah, I think people tend to um, ignore the fact that Florida was um, Spanish and that it was um, the first uh, ongoing colony in the Americas. The French were uh, tried to establish colonies. It didn't work. The British did, and it didn't work till later. But the longest ongoing run that we have of um, of a um, society European, um, not to not to ignore the indigenous populations, but it was a Spanish colony. And uh, given some people's objection to uh, um, Spanish immigrants now, forget that we started out with Spanish immigrants. Let me ask you this. The, the Spanish Empire, as I, as I mentioned a moment ago, lasted about, about 300 years before there was the rebellions in the early 1800s. Why do you think it lasted so long? I think because there was a, an excellent harbor there, but it was very hard to bring ships in um, to the harbor safely. And a lot of um, ships met their demise outside of St. Augustine Harbor. So that was one advantage. And as a consequence also, it was able to bring in ships as they preferred from other parts of, uh, of Europe. And I think that because the um, Spanish government wasn't really able to support them in the land area, uh, and they needed to bring in goods and, um, and individuals from other places, including the Canary Islands and um, the Portuguese there. There were a lot of different kinds of citizens. I think the integration of that kind of society helped, and also the free trade. Um, they um, they were liberal in terms of how they kept the books. There was one auditor who uh, was assigned by the crown to uh, to take a look at uh, what the uh, king's take was, and he wrote either either they don't know how to keep the books or they're. Um, they're not adhering to policy, let's say. So it was a multicultural society which worked. And um, I think that um, the integration of different elements of the society and obviously the work of um, African slaves who were able to come and become independent. There was a, a there, as in Latin America and, and in the uh, British colonies eventually, there was something in the Spanish colonies called the Conciencia de Si, which is, um, they understood that this was, um, they weren't part of the basic fabric of Spain anymore. Sort of a division that's, that's sort of peeled off, that ultimately, I mean, for the rest, I guess, the empire began to actually um, break up in, in the early 1800s then, I guess. Exactly. Huh. Um, to the extent that the ruling country wasn't able to take care of its people, um, they were trading independently. They obviously got ideas from other places. And uh, I, I think those were some of the elements um, that allowed the colony to uh, continue on. 
Well, we've been speaking with Dr. Susan Pickman. She has uh, written about life on the uh, Spanish-American colonial frontier, and we've been talking about the fact that while we may be celebrating the 400th anniversary of the first slaves to uh, land at Jamestown, uh, the uh, slaves actually arrived much earlier in many years uh, in Florida, which was, of course, controlled by Spain. We appreciate the time uh, that you uh, took with us this morning. Thank you. This has been Delmarva Today. I'm Don Rush. Thanks for listening.